And now let's get down to the topic at hand. I'm, I'm here to complain as usual about something, and I want to talk about 2110 timing. Um, we all know about 2110 timing, dash 21. If you're working with 2110, you know all about this. Um, and it needs no introduction. Um, it's basically about transmitter packet timing behavior. Uh, and it includes a receiver timing model like BBV and so on. And it defines the temporal characteristics of the packet flow in 2110. And we have two modes of timing. We have a narrow buffer mode, uh, very much like SDI, intended to be uh, enabling for direct SDI interfaces with low latency. And we also have a wide buffer uh, for software solutions like they used to be. But at the time we wrote the standard, that's how they kind of were. Um, and we also have a gapped mode, because for good SDI interface with the least amount of processing, we don't need to buffer things across the entire packet time, or the entire uh, frame time. So why do we do it this way? Well, SDI emulation. We want the stability and latency of SDI, and when we wrote the standard, this was paramount, because this is the evolution route, just like A to D and D to A converters are up and down across in the prior uh, transitions uh, of the industry. And like we've always done, we start with pixels in the upper left corner, and we start reading them out and building P groups and sending them, and we use the type N gapped model. And it works really well. It offers a latency very similar to SDI, certainly nothing objectionable, um, and it was a great thing for day one. Uh, but it reflects hardware implementations, and I would say now in a software world. Why the gapped model? Well, simplified the center design immensely. Absolutely minimal buffering. Uh, we have a linear model, which would spread the packets across the entire frame time, uh, but we're not really encountering anybody using that mode yet. Uh, and it simplifies receiver design. Again, minimal pop, uh, buffering. Uh, the linear model requires holding packets until the actual SDI playout time, which is, in fact, most of the frame. Uh, and so these are very important considerations to evolve the industry and get on the air quickly. In a retrospect, this makes great sense. Uh, SDI vendors, for the most part, were involved in writing the standards. And at the time, pure software implementations were not considered particularly viable. It was early days for doing 2110 in software. We didn't have Rivermax, we didn't have Mellanox, Intel, other pacing NICs, and so on. Um, and the gatewaying to and from SDI was the most important thing of the day with latency, simplistic hardware as much as possible, and SDI-like timing using PTP. And some of you may actually remember me being here, I don't know even how many years ago, before we got PTP in 2059, pounding on the idea of time-based synchronization. And, you know, we're very happy that that's all worked out really well. So how's it been working? Well, in a contained LAN environment, when all of the senders are narrow and whatever receiver mix is available, it works pretty well. Um, some narrow receivers are a little less than narrow. In fact, we've discovered over time uh, one or two vendors who, due to constraints of hardware implementation, uh, have been forced to squeeze the packet buffer a little bit. Um, so they fall over maybe, you know, a little bit of IAT sooner than other receivers. Uh, other receivers appear to be extremely wide, which is a good thing, plus or minus latency considerations. Um, we don't seem to have any wide transmitters anymore. The original software implementations we saw during the 2110 development um, all now seem to be able to meet uh, using Rivermax or other libraries on top of Mellanox or equivalent on top of Intel or uh, Matrox or other NICs. They can pretty much do narrow. Um, we still don't see linear uh, packet reschedules, which would be an interesting and useful thing maybe to spread out the timing, get rid of the gaps. Uh, don't see any PSF, thank you. If anybody's doing PSF, let's maybe try not. Uh, and of course, we still have interlace, and well, interlace is not gonna go away for quite some time still. So in large multi-core switch, multi-rate networks, uh, the network impacts start to come into play. Um, IAT is a big one, as you get more switch hops in effect, especially if you're going up to a higher speed core and coming back down to a lower speed interface. Uh, you can see packet jitter increasing as packet ordering gets swapped around. Um, we see some packet loss sometimes, and we see packet ordering issues sometimes. But pretty well overall. Narrow profile then, intended for hardware transmitters originally, with very constrained on emission times. For multiple identical streams, it has very, very excellent behavior constrains the buffering requirement and relatively straightforward to troubleshoot. Um, there is some impact, by the way, of precisely co-time sources. So if you have 50 cameras and they're all timed up like you would with color black, you certainly have a flurry of packets when they all reach vertical and start transmitting again. So why does type W even exist? Well, we thought software was going to be way too bursty and jerky and jittery. So 
when we wrote the standard, we implemented this second profile, the type W profile. Uh, and because we didn't really have contrary examples to this offered at the time, we didn't have the confidence to say, let's just make everything narrowish and let the software people figure out how to catch up. So we embraced the state of the art of that day. Um, and maybe we had limited future, future view, right, out of fear. We're writing a normative standard. So we can't go very far out on the limb of prediction of where the industry is going to go when we write a standard. We're al always better off to go back and fix something once it's real as opposed to doing something that's really predictive and risky. And this wasn't very risky. So it was a bit of a wet finger guess as to how bad software was. I can see a couple of people in this room who submitted product during the interops that actually couldn't do narrow at the time, but this drove our idea of of a wet finger for what the type W should be. But times have changed. Um, because of the growing pains of IP, the hardware centers, uh, or software-defined hardware, if you really want to call it that, they're nice and precise. Uh, and the software centers we found were sometimes even greater than a frame time of jitter, really, really not very good. And at the time, that, that was not unreasonable. Today, of course, and as Sergio said, uh, we do some things to offload. Uh, things like NICs that take care of things like packet coalescence on the NIC, TX pacing, of course, kernel bypass, a very important thing, as Sergio mentioned. And today, we can achieve type N pacing quite readily. And of course, receivers and software are pretty much a no-brainer. So the conundrum is this. We have a non-orthogonal relationship between receivers and senders. So any receiver can receive a type N. Only a type W can receive a wide sender. So N receivers exist today, but they'll only work with narrow sources. So if there's a wide source, it'll blow up the receiver. So we have selective interoperability in this standard. We have interoperability, but it's not universal across the two types of receivers and two types of senders. And a lot of things happen on the way to the receiver that we always have to consider, and maybe we didn't consider sufficiently when we wrote the standard. Mix of resolutions and frame rates, link speeds uh, up and down through multiple cores, uh, how the P groups are built. If you build very small P groups, you got an awful lot more packets than if you build a nice full P group and so on. And then there's, of course, all the network-induced stuff, link up and down ratings, uh, other traffic. And uh, yes, other traffic does happen. It's amazing to see a 2110 net network and you go poking on the network, it's like, what's that, what's that? And actually, other traffic does make its way onto your network, perhaps sometimes by design, perhaps inadvertently. All of these packets are sharing the same highway. It's the 405, except it's one lane. And network impairments, we have all sorts of them. Uh, reordering is a low percentage of packets, but it's actually real. We've seen plenty of reordering. We see multiple reordering, um, and this can incur delays due to receiver repair, if in fact the receiver repairs it at all. Ordering, of course, means you've got to go deeper than just the packet level. You've got to go into the RTP header. Um, bursts, of course, you're too early. You overflow, lost packets. If you gap too much, too late, lost packets. Regular IAT and people squeezing beta, I've had so many, uh, not so many, I've had a few people proudly tell me they can get up to 98% of link speed. It's like, read the standard. You're, that's a little bit too big, boys. So maybe we have some opportunities to improve the standard at this point in time. And my pitch is that we should think about this. Uh, having a simple receiver is okay. Hardware will be around for some time. Simplifying and enabling hardware implementations is important. Um, but a type N with a bare minimum of buffer is dangerous because you can upset the apple cart if your network is anything more than carefully groomed. Um, so there might be a good opportunity in doing things like, and a couple of people do this, I won't call out names, but kudos, um, configurable receiver buffer sizes. So you can tailor the receiver to the environment you're in. So maybe you don't want the eight packets, but you don't want 720 for HD. Somewhere in between is poor, probably a more reasonable number for your latency and your packet behavior on the network. Um, re not everybody implements reordering, it seems. Uh, you gotta dig deeper, but reordering of packets is pretty good. Now, if you only have an eight packet buffer, you gotta work fast to do your reordering and hope that that reordering fit within that buffer. Um, and the other thing, I mean, just to think about is, anybody remember dropout compensation? You have a videotape recorder, you drop out some stuff off the head, you take the prior line and you just insert. The same thing works in 2110, and it saves you a big black line across your picture. So in receivers, something like that offers additional, it's not really protection, but it's coverage, right? 
So using 2110, we have some opportunities, I think, as it is today. Build receiver buffers that are configurable. Dial in how much latency and how much packet buffer you want. The latency isn't everything. It's also very small compared to a frame time. And manage latency separately from the buffer size as far as the user is concerned. They, they, there's two kinds of users. There's the people who deal with the network and people who deal with the video system. And maybe presenting it to them in two different contexts is a useful thing. Uh, using the linear model will space out packets a little more. It'll buy us a little more headroom. We don't have the vertical gap. We don't have the burst uh, so much at, uh, at, at vertical sync time. And we'll get a uniform packet distribution as opposed to gaps. And it's really easy in software, of course. In hardware, well, your mileage may vary uh, depending on your implementation. But it's entirely possible if you have a bit of buffer, you can do this. Um, using consistent MTUs, consistent P grouping among streams helps make life simple for troubleshooting. Perhaps we can also improve the standard. And I'd like people to think about this a little. Maybe we lose the type N receiver model. Maybe it's done its job. We've discovered we got a bit of headroom in the standard. Latency is not a huge issue. And we might be able to better accommodate bigger, sloppier networks with a slightly wider, uh, narrow model. And maybe we relax the type N transmit model a little bit. We don't really need that level of timing tightness. It, it's nice. But there's, nothing, there's, there's no reason why we can't look at reducing the tightness of that. And tighten up the wide, wide transmit a lot. And perhaps maybe we look at doing one of each and amending the standard to say, OK, here's a universal receiver. Here's a universal transmitter. And the transmitter is one that can be accommodated in software today with the pacing NICs and the techniques we have. And at the same time, get away from the possibility of ever having a system where your narrow receiver will encounter a wide source and simply fall over. And personally, for me, I'd love to see us get to the point where we're moving frames. Networks are fast now at 400 gigs. You can shoot me a frame real fast. I don't have to wait for the frame time. Give me the frame. Let me process. I can get ahead of things, do my processing on that frame. I don't need to want, don't want or need to wait for that last pixel to come in before I handle my frame. Huh? Amen, a big amen. Um, I think that's what they do. Um, so in conclusion, I mean, 2110 was really good as an SDI replacement. I, I'm really proud of the standard SIMP you wrote. It's fantastic, it works really well. We picked best in breed external things that were already done for the first time ever. We wrote a standard that wasn't from the bits right on up. Brilliant. Um, we don't need SDI type timing anymore. In the same way SDI was sloppy compared to analog, which it was, right? And software can do the job and more, so why build hardware? And I'm a, I, I come from the hardware business, okay? So I understand that's a big business, an important business. You gotta still build hardware. There's lots of application for it. But more and more, software is gonna force its way towards the front end and the critical aspects of, of, of product design. Um, and software-defined hardware really is still just hardware, but software drives it. The beauty of software, of course, no supply chain problems. Maybe your customer can't buy COT servers because they're down on the allocation list, but it's a lot better problem than actually not being able to build product and ship product and disappointing customers. And then there's 2110 in the cloud, and we're not going to go there today. Uh, but it's problematic at best. We need solutions for the cloud that probably aren't 2110. The availability of multicast is an issue. Uh, packet pacing is an issue. PTP in the cloud. Well, there's alternate methods we need to be able to consider here. So. 2110 has proven itself to be robust and reliable. It's been proven at scale. It's a really good standard. Um, the real challenge are the networks and the standard itself in terms of this non-orthogonal interoperability, as I call it. Uh, wide transmitters aren't a thing anymore. If you build a wide transmitter, you really got to open up some books and look at what's going on, because you can build one quite readily that's narrow. And narrow receivers, as long as we have wide transmitter profiles, are not a thing. And so perhaps there's some future revision we can make to the standard that embraces legacy, but also accommodates where we really want to go in the future, which is guaranteed interoperability among any transmitter and any receiver. So as always with standards, to the stars with some difficulty, uh, but we've had a good trip so far. And that's all I had to say. Thank you. Uh -oh. All uh -oh. right. That was great. Here comes Andy. Here comes Andy, though. Uh -oh. you know, And now another view. There's no time for <laughs> questions, right? No, no, I'm sorry. We're, yeah, Annie, have a seat. All right. <laughs> Go ahead. He's got notes.
No, thank you. Very, very thought-provoking. Some good challenges there. I like it, Paul. That's great. Uh, just really a couple of observations. I think you know, you're very right. Your very final point, 2110 is not suitable for cloud. It, it's absolutely not. That's, it wasn't an intended thing. I think the reason we went narrow is because we are perpetuating our 90-year legacy of raster video with vertical interval gaps, and we were trying to pander to people that wanted very minimal latency and very minimal buffering. We did have those conversations in some of those meetings about, you know, we should actually, you know, cut with the past, but we haven't, and I think narrow is a, is a way of keeping the past going, which is, which is a challenge. I think the other key element, which you may have mentioned, but I didn't quite capture, just, you know, the reason we're, we've been so paranoid about pacing is because UDP inherently is, you know, you get packet loss as soon as you don't do things. And the other thing that's changed in the last six years is the buffer, de buffer depth on switch fabrics, because with a very small buffer depth, then that risk was even more of, of packet loss if, if you don't actually have that linearity. So I think things are evolving, and I think taking a, a, a refresh on this is a good idea, but I think we need to move to this concept of if we're going to be dealing with compute in the future, we need to do it differently from 2110. Agree. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, okay. So, so just wanted to point out, we didn't talk, or at least I don't remember you talking in your presentation at all about doing anything with CMAX, which I think is another thing. You know, granted, switch buffers are getting bigger. Um, but what I'm really concerned about is, the, is when I'm trying to put six um, 2110 streams that are from 1080i or 720p. I'm trying to put six of those on a single 10 gigabit interface. If I don't have good packet pacing, um, I'm going to get um, bursting that can be correlated across multiple senders, especially because they're all going to be in phase. And without some nice spreading out of those packets, I'm going to very quickly build some very tough buffer requirements on my switch and on anything that's downstream. So we need to keep that, you know, I, I, don't, I, I don't disagree with the points that you made, but I think we need to be really careful about playing with a standard that's pretty much done. And I, I, I'm not sure we want to open up that can of worms and really go there, but that's my, my viewpoint specifically for multiple streams sharing the same pipe with a limited amount of bandwidth. Agree with you. I mean, absolutely danger Will Robinson on this whole thing. Um, but just the, this fact that we have this interoperability problem between, I mean, we have a standard that's not completely interoperable, and the standard actually doesn't really articulate that well. So I'm just thinking, I'm thinking at this point in time or very soon it's worth a second look, and that's all I'm saying, and certainly I don't want to open a can of worms and pour it on the floor but perhaps it's a conversation others might be interested in. All that was all. But yeah, thank you, Wes. I yeah, by no means intend to break anything. It's all in the aid of improving things going forward. Hello, John. Ah, Mr. Briscoe. Uh, Mr. I, Mike. I realized as I stood here, I've never asked a question at one of these meetings ever. I just, not my style. Um, not, not that I don't have questions, but not generally my style. And, and so I just mostly wanted to thank you for giving this nice summary of the work we did and to thank everybody here who is somehow involved in the process. We started this 2110 process in SEMPTI 10 years ago, just to put a sort of blanket on that. And it had a good two and a half years of activity in the VSF before that. So this standard with a capital S that's now been revised a one-year review that took five years to accomplish, which was longer than writing the original documents, by the way. Um, ask us later why that was. It's, I agree with your assessment that the work we did has stood up and worked, and it's a fantastically successful from that standpoint. The, um, you know, obviously we all look at in retrospect and say, oh, you could have could have done slightly different, but given the number of viewpoints that we had to converge across a whole industry of people with differing levels of experience and different levels of expectation, I'm really, really proud of how it came out. You're waiting for a question. 
Not really, okay. but keep going. Yes. That's good. <laughs> um, but yeah, to Wes's comment about CMAX, my experience has been I haven't seen implementations show up in projects that have a problem with CMAX. Hmm. I think saying it out loud in the standard caused people to take it seriously and that particular thing was a huge reaction and some might say overreaction to the mistake we made in 2022-6. Because 2022-6 was completely silent on all those points about packet pacing and timing relative to sync and it showed almost every 2022-6 deployment encountered some headwind that was because of packet, the lack of a spec about packet pacing. So, I don't know, if I, my question is, do you, do you agree that CMAX is roughly okay like it is, or do you think that that's an area that relaxing it is gonna improve somebody's implementation ability? That's a really good question, and I, I don't have an answer. I mean, CMAX certainly works fine the way it is, uh, but if we look at the whole model, I think it's on the table with every other piece, uh, you know, the, the uh, VRX and, and all of that. Uh, but whether or not it needs to change, I have the sense that CMAX is actually not bad. Okay. And That's, Gerard's standing okay. behind me, so I'm going to ask him his oh, yeah. opinion on the same question. Uh, oh. If it's allowed to ask a question of the questioner. Uh, yeah, I, I, so I, that was great. I really enjoyed that. That was, um, that was even better than I thought it was going to be. Thank you. Uh, I think most of the most of the comments I kind of agree with most of them. So I just wanted to come up and talk a little bit about the buffering, and and actually kind of maybe talk a little bit to Wes's point. So I don't think we know of any. I mean, there are thousands and thousands of 2110 systems out there. I don't know of any problems where the, this kind of zipping together of six gigs on a 10 gig pipe has caused a problem. So I think it was something that we we were well aware might cause a problem, but I think, I think practical experience tells us that half decent data center grade switches, they do a really amazing job. The silicon is really amazing. Right. One of the things that's worth knowing is, yeah, sure. I mean, so buffer sizes are actually getting smaller, but the buffering architectures are getting more flexible. So on a 32 time, I mean, where's, where's uh, Chris? Chris can maybe comment if his kit is different to our kit, right? But Typically, 32 times 100 gigs, you've got 32 megabytes of storage. That used to be in slices or, or quadrants or some other semi part of a switch. And that's, that's when you got into trouble, when you plugged all your stuff into the first eight ports, and that used that could only have a quarter of the buffer, right? Now they're very flexible, very fungible. I've never seen a problem, really. I mean, the problem you get is exactly the one that you mentioned, right? When you're trying, trying to get 98% of an uplink, surprise, surprise, nobody can be 100% efficient. And that is when it fails. So. I would say all of the things you talked about, I think, are good in terms of flexibility, interoperability, making life simpler. I think typically the network is not the problem if you design it nicely enough. And actually today, 400 gig, 800 gig, 1.6 come in. Um, I, the bandwidth is surprisingly cheap, and actually often you can solve almost all of these problems by throwing a bit of bandwidth at it, which is, yeah, it costs a bit of money, right? But you're not, I've, never, I've also never seen a system that's got smaller or hasn't got bigger than was originally built. So chuck a bit of bandwidth at it and you're probably solving almost all your problems. Great comments, thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. Thank you so well, much. Thank you so much. I'm so glad we could get you on, man. Oh, no problem. You too.